this question. Um, what's the most shocked you've ever felt? Like, am I in a moment that something happened you totally did not see coming and it just left you speechless? Or maybe uh, if you were here last week, uh, Chad was talking about how sometimes we have expectations, right? I mean, we had an expectation of something going a particular way, a conversation going a particular way, and it ends up going completely different from what we expected. Uh, for some reason, I was writing this prompt, and my mind went to sports. Um, I'm a huge fan of soccer, or as some of you here know, the real football. Um, and my favorite team is FC Barcelona, greatest soccer team of all time. Um, and at that time, the, 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 the memory that came to my mind, they still had playing for them who is arguably the greatest human being to have ever touched a football, Lionel Messi. God, thank you so much for him. Please always protect him. Anyway, um, it's August of 2020. Uh, it's the quarterfinals of the Champions League. Champions League is this very prestigious European soccer tournament. It sounds a little Eurocentric, but the general understanding is whoever wins the Champions League is probably the best uh, soccer team in the world. Barcelona obviously has won it several times. Middle of COVID, so there's no audience at, at the games. You're all, everybody's watching on TV, and they're playing for quarterfinals, Bayern Munich. Bayern Munich is a German team. At that point, they were also probably one of the great teams ever assembled. They were just this like, perfectly synchronized machine. They never made any mistakes. You've been destroying their, their rivals, but... We have Messi, so if Messi is for us, who can be against us, right? So, you know, game goes in, uh, game starts, uh, four minutes in, Bayern Munich scores a goal, which you never want to see happen. You get nervous. Two minutes later, one of Bayern's players actually scores an own goal, so now we're even, 1-1. One, one. And then there's like this 10, 12 minutes of kind of like just back and forth, normal play. Minute 22, Bayern scores again. Minute 27, Bayern scores again. Minute 31st, guess what happened? Bayern scores again. The game ends up 8-2 to two win from Bayern. Barcelona is eliminated. And you have to understand is this is not a normal score in soccer, okay? Most soccer games are between like the zero and the three goal range. Like that's, that's how they're decided. And I remember feeling this feeling of shock and confusion and anger after that game, and it, it made no sense to me. That doesn't happen to us. We do that to other teams. They don't do it to us. God, how could this happen? Messi, how could this happen, right? Like all this sense of confusion. I actually went back on, on, on my social media history, and I found what I posted on Facebook right after that game. I got a little carried away, okay? I don't know what to tell you, right? <laughs> my point is this. Um, I had all these expectations, and they were crushed. And in the aftermath of my crushed expectations, I felt sad and angry and confused. Now, you know, soccer is relatively silly. I think it's the most beautiful sport in the world, but it's, you know, it's, it's not life or death, right? But what about when we experience real, deep, profound disappointment or pain or loss. How do we deal with those moments? Uh, we're right in the middle of this three-week series that we're calling, very appropriately, Three Days. And basically what we're doing is we're taking a look at the last three days of Holy Week, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. And the main idea we're trying to explore is how do we deal with life in the moments when it seems like it all falls apart, and could it be that in the midst of our questions and our confusion and our doubt, that God can still work miracles? Uh, last week, Chad started out by talking about Good Friday and how for the people following Jesus, that must have been one of the most disappointing moments of their lives. Think about it. They have lived, left everything behind to follow this rabbi, and they had all these expectations of him. And as you're watching him be crucified... All those expectations are shattered. And what I look at today is what happens after that. When the worst thing that could have happened actually happens. And you're left shocked and speechless and confused and maybe full of questions. What do we do then? So on that cheery note, 
I want to invite you to go with me to Matthew chapter 27. I'm going to start reading on verse 57. As evening approached, Joseph, a rich man from Arimathea who had become a follower of Jesus, went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate issued an order to release it to him. Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a long sheet of clean linen cloth. He placed it in his own new tomb, which had been carved out of the rock. Then he rolled a great stone across the entrance and left. Both Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting across from the tomb and watching. The next day on the Sabbath, the leading priests and Pharisees went to see Pilate. They told him, sir, we remember what that deceiver once said while he was still alive. After three days, I will rise from the dead. So we request that you seal the tomb until the third day. This will prevent his disciples from coming and stealing his body and then telling everyone he was raised from the dead. If that happens will be worse off than we were at first. Pilate replied, take guards and secure the best you can. So they sealed the tomb and posted guards to protect it. This is really all we get as far as what happens between the death of Jesus on Good Friday and his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Jesus is buried. Pilate put some, some guard outside his tomb. And to be honest with you, I've been wrestling a little bit this week on how to preach this passage because, to be honest, there's nothing much to preach there, right? It's a very procedural account. Like, you know, they bury Jesus and they then put some, some guards outside. That, that's about it. So what I think I'm going to do this morning is I want to talk about what's not being said in the story. Um, I grew up in the charismatic tradition, and in my tradition, we don't call that Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Holy Saturday. We call it uh, Silent Saturday. Uh, my guess is that, you know, we don't want to sound super Catholic, so uh, Silent Saturday sounds a little better. Uh, but, but I think that part of the reason is because um, how silent the Gospels are on what goes on this day. Notice that the main character that we've been following along all throughout the Gospels are, are silent. Jesus is dead and buried, so he's not going to say anything yet. But for some reason, none of the Gospel writers really mention anything about the disciples on this day. And in part, this makes sense because it's the Sabbath, and the Sabbath is the day of rest. Everybody's probably home uh, and no much action going on. Uh, but I wonder if there's another reason. And that is that chances are that they weren't saying that much on this day. Not only because it was the Sabbath, but because their whole lives had come crashing down. The disciples had left everything behind to follow Jesus. And with Jesus gone, they were not only dealing with the pain of losing their master and friend. They were also dealing with the fact that all that they had sacrificed and left behind and spend the last three years of their life pursuing was for nothing, you know? And not only that, but they were also probably afraid that they were next, right? What if for the Sanhedrin and for Pilate, getting rid of Jesus wasn't enough? What if next they were going to come for his followers? So assuming most of them are in a house hiding, not wanting to go out, not wanting to be seen, because they're afraid that they might come next. Uh, last week, Chad uh, was talking about how sometimes we have these expectations of Jesus, that a lot of times don't line up with the reality of who Jesus is. And Chad said something. Um, I don't know what your Friday is, he said. I know, but you know what your Friday is. And as I'm listening to Chad preach, my mind went back to April 10, 2022. Uh, I think I've shared with some of you, before I came on staff here, I was a pastor at a church that my wife and I started in Washington, D.C., called Encounter. We that for about five years and... We're a very small congregation, and in the aftermath of COVID, we never could really recover. Like we tried doing it for a year, but finances were hard, people were hard, and we just had to make the unfortunate decision of closing down. And April 10, 2022 was the last time we met together. The, the Sunday before, we had had this kind of like final uh, farewell service. And then April 10th, which ironically was Easter, uh, I'm sorry, was Palm Sunday that, that year, um, a few people came over to our house, and we had like a little brunch, and we were just sharing stories about the church. It was, it was a nice time. We even got to baptize somebody. It was great. But my mind went back to the afternoon of that day, because after everybody left and we were by ourselves, I remember sitting down on the couch, and I was trying to watch TV. I was trying to take a nap. I was trying to do something to kind of like get my mind of what had happened, and I was just in this 
state of shock. I was confused. I was sad. I was angry. I didn't know how that happened. I didn't know what was going to happen. I really was very, it was a very disorienting moment in my life. And I'm not trying to compare me being in a comfy couch, you know, <laughs> to what the disciples were going through. But I'm imagining that it was, the feeling at least was similar. Like the idea that you've been pursuing this thing for so many years and you thought God was involved in it and then it didn't go the way you thought it was going to go and now what do you do? And maybe you have experienced that as well. The day after the divorce is finalized. The day after the funeral and the burial. The day after you went home with your box, with your belongings from the job that you thought was going to be the job we're going to have your whole life. The day after they leave. The day after the diagnosis. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we experience in the aftermath of these moments of pain and suffering, we experience these, t- these times of, of confusion and disorientation. Chances are that whatever your Friday was is not something that you didn't bring before God. It's something probably that you prayed for and you prayed a lot and you were hoping and you were believing that God was going to come through and somehow what you were hoping that happened didn't happen. The thing you were afraid of actually came to pass. How, what do we do then? How can we move on? How do we deal with disappointment also with the questions and the doubts? And uh, what, what I want to show you today is that I think that the story of Holy Saturday gives us some clues and some tools on how to process disappointment and loss and death. The first thing I think this story tells us is that in the aftermath of loss and death and disappointment, we first have to grieve. What's the story? The, the story that we read, what happens in that story? Well, Jesus is dead. And Joseph and Arimathea, what's funny is the disciples are nowhere to be found, right? It's Joseph and Arimathea and the women that were following Jesus. But they had this idea, we can't just ignore that this happened. We can't just sweep it under the rug. We cannot just walk away and leave Jesus hanging across. We have to deal with this. So they bring him down from the cross and they wrap him in cloths and they bury him. They don't ignore the fact that something has died. They actually deal with that fact. Uh, The scene that we read, uh, it's been depicted in art by some of the greatest artists of all time. My favorite one is Caravaggio. I always liked his style because it's very like, you know, almost like cinematic. Like it feels like I'm watching like the still of a movie. And I find it fascinating that this passage that we've read about is dealt with by artists a lot, but it's barely talked about in the church. I mean, like if you think about kind of like the, the, the calendar of preaching, like, you know, you have a Good Friday service, and then usually you have Easter Sunday. Like, unless you grow up in a tradition that has an Easter visual, you probably don't, even in our preaching calendars, we don't talk much about that. Part of the reason is because, as I told you, there's really not much <laughs> to preach in the text. Um, but I believe that for us to properly understand and process and grieve the events of Good Friday... And also to properly understand, appreciate, and celebrate the events of Easter, we have to go through Saturday. This past week, I was reading a book on this topic, and the author said this. Whatever meaning and importance we discover Easter Saturday to have would not lie in the fact that it is numerically second, the antecedent of a third day, and no other the postulate exclusively of a first, not its number in the series, but its place bears its significance. As that day between the days which speaks solely neither of the cross nor of the resurrection, but simultaneously remembers the one and awaits the other and guarantees that neither will be heard or thought about or lived without the other. What Alan Lewis, the author of this book, is trying to to, to kind of like uh, communicate is that in order for us to fully grasp both the reality and the gravity of death and the hope and the joy of the resurrection, we actually need to sit in a tomb for a bit. And that's what Saturday is about. And you may be hearing me say this and you may think it sounds like super morbid. And maybe, but this is the point. Um, 
there are no resurrection stories without death stories. The philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, of all people, said this, only where there are graves are the resurrections. I think that this is true about understanding and appreciation of the Easter story. We've been doing this song called Sunday is Coming last week, and the whole point of that song is that Easter and Good Friday inform each other of their meaning. How can we possibly say that the day when Jesus was killed was good? Because Sunday is coming. But without Easter, Good Friday isn't good at all. But at the same time, what we celebrate in Easter is so incredibly and wonderful and joyous, and it gives us so much hope because we believe that Jesus was actually dead. We don't believe that Jesus was pretending to be dead. We don't believe that Jesus was like really, really like sick and on death's door. We believe that Jesus was dead, dead. (laughs) And because we believe that Jesus was dead, dead, what we celebrate at Easter is so revolutionary that God would somehow be able to reverse that, to undo that and raise Jesus from the dead. Changes absolutely everything we know about everything. If that's true, then all things are possible. All sorts of possibilities exist. And I'm going to stop there because that's next week's sermon. So I'm going to like, you know, get a hold of myself. My point is this. This dynamic is true about our appreciation of the Easter story. But I think that it's also true of how we process our moments of pain and suffering and disappointment today. You know? That that when we have these expectations, and those expectations didn't come through, these deaths that can be literal or figurative in our lives, the Fridays that that Chad was talking about last week, we actually need to deal with those. We can't just pretend that they're not happening, ignore them. We have to deal with those. And Saturday is a space where we deal with what has happened on Friday. It's a space where we allow ourselves to feel all the feelings, the pain and the hurt, and honestly, sometimes the despair and confusion and doubts and anger and frustration. That's what Saturday is for. I grew up in the charismatic tradition, and I, I have the, I mean, I'm very grateful for it. Like It gave me my faith, really. But I remember growing up that it was very common that you were expected to always kind of like present a positive attitude of faith, right? Every time you say hi to somebody, how you doing? It's like, I'm blessed. I'm in victory. And the reality is that sometimes you weren't feeling blessed or in victory, right? That life was difficult and hard. And saying that things are great when they're not is not faith, is delusion. But by the way, I think that we do that sometimes. That people ask us how you're doing. We always believe that we have to put up a good face, and say that things are great. We curate our social media, and we're always having fun, and our kids are always behaving, and and we're always getting along with our spouses, and everything's phenomenal, right? Like, you don't pose the, you know, your son sneaks into your bed at midnight and starts coughing in your face because not feeling well, right? You don't do that, right? You pose, oh, he's so cute, whatever, right? Punch a kid in the face. No, like, he's like hugging somebody. And I don't think that we do that because we're hypocrites. I think that we do that because we think that that's what we're supposed to do, that like somehow we don't know what to do with pain and disappointment, how to process it. And we feel like if we are grieving or feeling sad or angry or confused, that somehow we're being bad Christians or that we lack faith. And what's ironic about that is when you look at the Bible, the Bible is like the complete opposite of that. Take a read through the psalmist, and the psalmist is like the psalms of lament. God, where are you? How did you allow this to happen? God, my enemies are multiplying around me. They're circling me. I feel like I'm dying. I feel like I'm wasting away. Like the language that the psalmist uses is, it's, it's a language of lament. The Bible has so many resources of dealing with grief. You will see in the Jewish kind of like tradition, amount of practices for that. You would see when somebody dies, somebody would like rend their clothes and they would like sit in sackcloth and ashes. Even today in the Jewish tradition, there's a practice of sitting Shiva where you kind of like are sitting in a low stool to grieve and acknowledge the fact that somebody died. Uh, Last week, I was actually at this lecture in D.C. from this, uh, it's, it's a Jewish scholar, but that specializes in New Testament. And, and as she's giving this lecture, she's kind of like talking about the scene in the Gospel of Matthew. When Jesus dies, the curtain, the veil in the temple splits in two. And she was saying how like in, in Christianity, we usually preach that as meaning that 
humanity has its full access to God now, right? Like that's like the, the curtain that divides the rest of the temple from the Holy of Holies. And now everybody has access to that through Jesus. And I affirmed that, believing that. But she was saying, as a Jewish person, reading that story, that's not the first place that her mind goes. The first place that her mind goes is to the Jewish practice of Kriya. And the practice, I, I mentioned it earlier, is that when somebody that you love died and when you got the news that they were dead, the very first thing that you would do was that you would rend your garments into two. That somehow in the aftermath of the death of Jesus, that God, the Father, mourns and grieves what has happened to his son. In order for us to deal with what has happened on Friday, we have to learn to grieve. Because here's the thing, sometimes, and this, this is why, okay? Because sometimes, like, I was talking about expectations, and, you know, sometimes expectations can be, like, trivial things. <laughs> no, no, it's not trivial, but, like, like, okay, you wanted a raise, and you didn't get it, right? Like, you, you were working for this thing, and it didn't happen, and you wanted to, like, get this job, and it didn't work out. And, you know, I, I think that that's normal. But if we're honest with that, sometimes the expectations are that, that this third pregnancy would actually finally come to terms. that this cancer that's spreading all over the valley would, would stop. That he would stop drinking. That your child that hasn't said a word to you since he left the house at 18 would finally answer your calls. You're going before God and you're praying and you're asking and you're begging God to do something. And it doesn't happen. And the thing is that we sometimes feel like we don't get to be sad. And we don't get to grieve that because somehow that means that we're um, unfaithful to God. What I want to show you is that the Bible is full of people banging their fists against the heavens saying, God, why did this happen? You can hear anything else from me today. You get to grieve what happened to you. You get to feel confused, you get to feel sad, you get to doubt, you get to maybe feel anger. What we see in the Bible is that God is a God that's big enough and loving enough and wise enough to handle that. And the most difficult part of that, though, is that sometimes in those times we feel like God is silent. I think it's one of the reasons why it's also called Silent Saturday in certain traditions. Because in our pain, we feel like God isn't there. And the question is, why do we do that? I, I think there's a couple of things. The first thing we say, you need to process this with somebody. You hear us here talk a lot about therapy and counseling. And we don't say that because we think that that's like an easy solution for everything. But we believe it's a step. That, 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 that there has to be a setting in which you can just share how you feel and let it out. And, and we want to help you with that. Like if you want to, you know, you guys know that we have this connection with Safe Harbor. If you have any questions or need help with that, reach out to us. That's part of what our Easter offering is for precisely because we don't want finances to get in the way of anybody getting the help that they need. Now, the second thing is, the, is this. Though. Um, you know, last week I was talking about the difference between our expectations of Jesus and the reality of who Jesus is. And you saying, you know, Jesus is not necessarily like this fixer of problems all the time. Jesus comes to give us something much deeper, bigger than that. Jesus comes to give us life, to give us hope, to give us forgiveness of our sins, to give us the possibility to be transformed and ultimately of eternal life with the Father. But there's something else that Jesus came to. I would argue that Jesus came to join us in the full breadth of the human experience, of which, unfortunately, suffering is a big part. What that means is that whatever it is that we're grieving, in a way, God, through Jesus, has experienced that as well. That when we grieve, Jesus grieves with us. A few years ago, I was going through this very difficult time with my mental health, and I felt like God didn't care. I believe that God could do something about my mental agony, but for whatever reason, God chose not to. It wasn't a faith problem. I never stopped believing that God was real or that he had the power to help me. I just felt like he didn't care. I, I had, In a way, I had done what Chad said, right? I had let go of my expectations of God to come through for me in this matter. 
The problem was that then I replaced those expectations with another set of expectations, and that was that God didn't care. That was happening to me didn't matter to God. I had not embraced, embraced the reality of who God actually was. You know what helped me? This past, this Isaiah chapter 53. I don't even remember how I came across. I mean, I, I was familiar with it, but in the middle of that time, God brought this passage to me. This is what it says. Talking about Jesus. He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. Sorry, I lost my, my notes for a second. Is it there? Okay. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his struggles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. You know what was kind of like the sense that I got of that passage? Of Jesus being acquainted with the deepest grief? That maybe even if God was not answering my prayers, even if God for some reason felt absent and silent, because of what Jesus got gone through, at least he knows how I feel. The Christian philosopher James K. Smith says that God never really gives in the Bible an answer to the why of suffering and evil, but he does give us a response. And that's Jesus on the cross. And if that's true, maybe I'm not so alone after all. Have you ever been comforted by somebody who's gone through the same thing you've gone through? That maybe it is that you have trouble with infertility or that you lost a dear family member to uh, insidious disease and that somehow the people that know that, they don't have to tell you much to comfort you. It's just the fact that you both know what it's like, that hug, that, that, that partnership there, that's something for us. There's a kinship that happens. At the cross, Jesus looks at us with a crown of thorns on his face with blood pouring down, with hands nailed to a cross, having been betrayed, abandoned, mocked, unjustly tried. God looks at us and he says this, it happened to me too. The thing that you've gone through, the pain, the betrayal. Jesus came into the world to sit with you and to suffer with you. So we grieve, and hopefully we grieve with Jesus. We understand that we have the company of Jesus, but there's something that happens in the midst of that. And that is that, that then, because we're with Jesus, because we understand that God, that, that God through Jesus has gone through the same thing, we are allowed to have the strength that we need to wait. Let me take you back to the passage uh, in Luke. It's like the, the Luke accounting of what we just read. Verse 55, Luke 23. As his body was taken away, the women from Galilee followed and saw the tomb where his body was placed. Then they went home and prepared spices and ointments to anoint his body. But by the time they were finished, the Sabbath had begun, so they rested as required by the law. In the first century uh, Jewish culture, the way you count the days is kind of like starts in the evening. So like whenever the sun goes down, that's the next day. So what's happening is this. Jesus dies on Friday. He's crucified. They bring him down from the tomb. They bury him in the tomb. And part of the Jewish tradition is that you would kind of like uh, protect the body. So there was these spices and ointments that would basically help the body decay like slower and also, like, for the smell not to get too bad, it's just a way of honoring the dead. And the women wanted to do that for Jesus. They go home to prepare that, and they run out of time because the sun goes down on Sabbath, so you can do anything on Sabbath. So all Saturday, they're waiting. You know what they're waiting for? Sunday. Now, they have no idea what's going to happen on Sunday. They don't know what God is doing on Sunday. They're just waiting for Sunday so they can get back to the tomb and tend to the dead body of their Lord and their friend. My guess is that these women also had expectations of Jesus that didn't come true. But their love for Jesus 
was greater than whatever disappointment they might have felt due to their own met expectations. I bet that if Jesus hadn't resurrected, they would have kept showing up to his tomb just out of love. And I think there's a lesson for us there that in our moments of pain and disappointment and death, when our expectations of God have not been met, when God seems absent and silent, what will keep us connected to God will not be just hope or faith, it will be love. Uh, last year, I think, I, I read this blog post here uh, of this woman, Jane Markeshke. She was uh, a singer that gets cancer three times. Her husband leaves her, and, and she's really, like, dying. She starts processing her feelings on the Internet, and she writes this essay. I'll just read you these two verses to, to kind of, like, center our time here. I have had cancer three times now. and uh, I have barely past 30. There are times when I wonder what I must have done to deserve such a story. I fear sometimes that when I die, I meet with God, that he will say I disappointed him or offended him or failed him. Maybe he'll say I just never learned the lesson or that I wasn't grateful enough. But one thing I know for sure is this. He can never say that he did not know me. I am God's downstairs neighbor banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. I show up at his door every day, sometimes with songs, sometimes with curses, sometimes apologies, gifts, questions, demands. Sometimes I use my key under the mat to let myself in. Other times I sulk outside until he opens the door to me himself is this incredibly moving imagery and I think it's the same thing that the women are doing and it's this that even in the aftermath of our shattered hopes and dreams and expectations if our souls have met Jesus there's nothing else that will satisfy and the thing that will bring us back to him is not the hope that he might do something different. It's the idea that we want to be close to him because we love him. And maybe sometimes for us on Saturday, that's got to do. <laughs> that's got to be enough. But here's the thing. We don't grieve. We don't wait without hope because we live on the other side of Easter. We know how the story ends. We know what happens on Easter Sunday, don't we? And even if it doesn't feel like it right now, can the knowledge of that sometimes give us a little bit of hope about the future? I remember years ago reading this tweet from Bob Goff. He's like, I think I mentioned him before. He's like lawyer, Christian, that does all sorts of, of things. And he said this, darkness fell, his friends scattered, hope seemed lost. But heaven just started coming to three. We're at two right now. But the count is enough. Can you wait just a little longer? You hold on. This is passage in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, it's a prophecy that God gives the people of Israel from when they're going to be in exile. It says this. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And the rest of the passage is that the bones are coming back to life, and like tendons start growing, and then God breathes life into the bones. But for the people reading that, when they read that, they are in exile. They're looking at their lives broken. They're looking at their hope, gone. They're looking at their dreams, dead. And there is where Jesus, a God sends his prophecy and asks them this question. Look around at the wreckage of what was once your life. No, not me. And these bones live. The question of Saturday of the tomb where Jesus is laying, can these bones live? The question of Saturday of your life, of your dead hopes and broken dreams, your relationship that didn't work out, of your life filled with regret, can these bones live? Can they? 
But you join us next week to find out what happens.